Good morning. Uh, my name is John Frankfurt. I'm a senior educational technologist at the Center for New Media Teaching and Learning. This is our first session, so once again, welcome to the conference. We're very happy to have you here. This is our mapping a compelling educational route session. So this session is about mapping, specifically mapping technology in the classroom. Uh, fundamental to this panel is providing a framework and guide for mapping technology that will illuminate what digital media can do in the classroom that hasn't been done before. How might these new emergent approaches extend the power of the educator? How do our traditional concepts of mapping change as we seek new modes of digital pedagogy? What lessons can we learn from the use of mapping for teaching that can be carried over for future curricular development? It's worth pointing out that Mapping as a teaching tool has existed many years uh, before there was any notion of digital media or the World Wide Web. The word mapping itself need not apply to geographical maps and is used in a variety of professions, whether it be in the sciences where we are talking about mapping the human genome or the social sciences in an attempt to conceptually map conflict and negotiation in Mozambique. We also have maps that are visualizations of well-known historical events. Here we have Tufti's famous Napoleon's March to Moscow. Today, uh, we should also remember uh, the US presidential campaign season, and a lot of us are focused on our map, blue states, red states, battleground states. Uh, this has all become common terminology for many of us. For this session, we're going to highlight examples of projects whose focus is on New York City. In particular, projects that use mapping of New York City as a means to achieve a curricular goal. During my introduction, I'm going to do a very brief demonstration of two projects, Sacred Gotham and Mapping the African American Past. And following this, we're going to hear about the New York Neighborhoods Project used in Ken Jackson's History of New York lecture course. Presenting on behalf of Professor Jackson is Valerie Paley, who has served as the lead TA for this course for several years now. After a presentation of Professor Jackson's project, we hear about mapping the election project presented by Sheila Cornell uh, from the School of Journalism. Nowadays, uh, there are a number of different options an instructor can take advantage of should they choose to include mapping technology in their teaching. For some time now, Columbia and other like-minded institutions have subscribed to and made available various GIS software. GIS, which is an acronym for Geographic Information Systems, integrates hardware, software, and data for capturing, managing, analyzing, and displaying all forms of geographical reference information. It's worth pointing out that Jeremiah Trinidad Christensen from CU Libraries Electronic Data Services is here and now waving. Uh, and he is around to answer questions maybe throughout the day, but at least uh, during the session about uh, the GIS software here at the university that faculty may consider using for their research and teaching. In addition to the number of customized GIS tools which are subscribed to and made available by our library, one can now take advantage of the many user-friendly, free online mapping tools that are out there. Google, Yahoo, or Microsoft. Many faculty have found that implementing a mapping assignment into their teaching is just a matter of pointing their students in the direction of one of these freely available tools. The projects you're going to see today have all in some way or another taken things such as Google Maps or Google Earth and customized them and put them into the projects that you're going to see demoed. And least we forget that every day, at every moment, we have startups, small businesses, entrepreneurs, the independent programmer developing and pushing out mapping tools free or for a small nominal price. By the time I finish this sentence, it's likely that another mapping tool will be released and made available on the web. And while perhaps these mapping tools may be intended to help the tourist, a commuter caught in traffic, or the bird watcher in the park, the potential for repurposing these tools for teaching goals should not be underestimated or overlooked. Since our doors first opened over nine years ago, we here at the Center for New Media Teaching and Learning have worked with many faculty across the campus on mapping projects. Here in this slide you see behind me are some of the projects we've worked on recently and uh, way back in the past. 
Uh, two of our projects, which I'm going to talk about now, are Sacred Gotham and Mapping the African American Past. In Courtney Bender's Religion in the City course, maps and mapping technologies help students better conceptualize the image impact of larger social trends in specific religious groups. Students conducted individual research projects on religious sites in Manhattan, through which they tried to understand how larger changes in the city have influenced those sites, whether by shifting immigrant populations and changes in local economics using anthropological, historical, and sociological approaches. Mapping the African American Past was made available to public schools throughout New York City and New York State, and they've been using it to support their teaching of African American history. Visitors to the map site can explore an interactive map of New York City pinpointing locations related to people and events of significance in African American history. The environment includes an extensive collection of resources, including profiles of people and events, commentary by faculty here at the university, film clips, and digitized documents from Columbia University's libraries and other archives throughout New York City. A contemporary map of New York City and the highlighted locations within MAP can be juxtaposed with a range of archival New York City maps, how neighborhoods have changed around selected locations, as well as the rhetoric of these antique uh, archival maps, how they may overemphasize sea trade, or how they show more nature than ever existed in a map of New York City, housing, etc., are just some of the takeaways we could get from these maps. The map web application is also available for use on iPhone and iPod touch devices as a mobile learning platform. Map for the iPod and iPhone provides educational media that can be downloaded on demand over mobile and Wi-Fi networks, allowing students to access research materials and localized coordinates, coordinates via their devices map applications, Google Maps, while out on location, while out perhaps doing field work. If you want to hear more about map, my colleague Mark Phillipson will be doing a live demo. I've been showing you slides during the Digital Bridges session at 11 o'clock. Now our other presenters will be talking about uh, the projects I mentioned earlier, New York Neighborhoods Project and the Election Mapping Project. First, Val Valerie Paley followed by Sheila Cornell. Uh, Maria Ginelli, my colleague, will be participating in these two presentations and afterwards uh, we'll have some time for questions. So Maria is going to take over and we're going to do a brief little transition. Great. Okay. Um, every year or every other year for the past 35 that Ken Jackson has taught the History of New York City course. Uh, this is an enorm enormously popular course uh, known for its all-night bike ride. Uh, enrollment is typically between 350 and 400 students. Uh, its popularity is possibly uh, because of the bike ride. You have to be in the course uh, in order to go on it. Uh, the fun requirements like going on walking tours of New York. Uh, and perhaps the professor who's a very engaging authority on the history of New York City. Um, in the past, the assignment uh, for the course has included a choice of final paper topics. The more creative one being to write a walking tour subject to Professor Jackson's approval. Last year, however, with the help of CNMTL, the professor expanded this assignment to give it wider and greater relevance. Um, you want to show the outline for this one? Sure. Uh, we called it a neighborhood analysis as opposed to a walking tour divided the uh, five boroughs of New York City into around 250 neighborhoods. Uh, these areas, however, were quite obscure, not the kinds one finds in New York City guidebooks. Um, students worked in groups of three or four, and each team made a choice of one neighborhood from the large list. And they were told uh, to do three things. Uh, one, a historical analysis of the area. Uh, you see it in the outline up there to a contemporary analysis, uh, which would include demographic data, cultural data, uh, essentially giving an investigation of what the neighborhood is currently like. Uh, students were required to use oral history. 
and to interview people on the street and to go into a bar, restaurant, bodega, or a house of worship and interview people there about the neighborhood. The third part of the assignment was a walking tour using maps and images with specific directions on how to get around the area and how to get there. Um, can you show the report template now? There we go. To make the uh, project more interesting for the students, we called on CNMTL to uh, create a template for a wiki which the students, in which the students would enter the data and text. Here is their um, template and how to do it. Um, and, how, and be able to work interactively with each other and with members of the class and sharing their information about what they were learning. Um, it was very easy and interactive and it facilitated collaborative work among the teams. Um, on the left side there, you'll see uh, the different neighborhoods or the different boroughs of New York City. Uh, let's just click on Brooklyn for a second. You see there are all the neighborhoods in Brooklyn that were actually uh, worked on. And uh, let's see. Let's go to uh, the map, actually. And you'll see all the neighborhoods in all of the city that we worked on, each pinpoint representing a project. In time, when the course is offered again, the hope is for there to be pinpoints all over the map of the city representing uh, every corner of it, as well as uh, an individual project. Now let's navigate to Bedford Park. This is a typical uh, project worked on by three students. Uh, Bedford Park is in the North Bronx, and uh, you see an outline of the whole project. You also see in cap letters, and we're going through this fairly quickly, a, uh, the comments that the TA who was grading this, uh, this project made. So again, this interactivity uh, in the uh, project. And then the walking tour, which is at the bottom. You see how maps were used in, in this. You want to blow up, yeah, you blip see all the different areas that are uh, represented by pinpoints. These are areas that are investigated in the walking tour. The orange is the walking tour. Yes. And the orange is the, is the uh, route to take. Do you want to go back to the tour itself? And keep scrolling. You see there are instructions uh, on how to get from one point to another. In any case, the results for this project were very positive. Uh, it changed the course dynamics. It showed how technology can inform pedagogy. And it was a very innovative approach to learning. The students took to it quite easily and enthusiastically. Uh, the future of this project is very interesting. We've been in touch with the Department of City Planning to see how we might be able to share this information and work collaboratively with them. Uh, the hope is that eventually, with the proper editing and vetting, this might become a public site for more widespread use. Anything else? Anything else you want to add? No, I think that covers the, this particular project. Thank you, Valerie. Okay, sir. Uh, now we'll hear from Sheila Cornell, who will introduce you to uh, how mapping has been used at the journalism school in the past and how we're using it this semester on a project with one of their uh, main uh, required courses. Good morning, everybody. I, um, I teach investigative reporting at, at the journalism school. And journalists now have to deal with a lot of information and try to make sense of that information for their readers or viewers. And there is so much out there. In the past, you know, the classic of the genre, if you watch All the President's Men, you go into a parking lot and Deep Throat tells you what's going on. Now you have to deal with so much information that's on the web, that's in books, that's in journals. And I found that the students were drowning in a mass of information. We found that mapping is a very good tool, it's a very good thinking tool, it's a very good reporting tool that helps students make sense of information and the correlation of different sets of information. For example, geographic information together with demographic information or the results of, say, a study on, on one of the things we'll show you is, say, an attorney general's report on drugstores that sell um, um, this is expired drugs and putting that in a map makes them see trends, patterns, outliers that they will not see 
if they're just looking, say, at a spreadsheet or a textual article. So we started out by, by looking at New York. One of the projects that one of my students did was looking at New York crime statistics and seeing how accurate those statistics are. So we downloaded data, publicly available data, from the NYPD website showing the incidence of crimes in the different precincts of New York. We wanted to see then whether there were patterns in the crimes and whether we could use what we saw in the maps as ideas for doing further reporting. So this is what we did with the help of Jeremiah, who's with the electronic data, EDS, at, uh, at, the, um, at the library. And we put, you, you see here police precincts, those are police precinct numbers, and um, say assaults. Uh, and you could, and we, we overlaid this with um, census tract data. So they were able to play around using Google Earth. They were able to look at, say, was there a correlation between ethnic, ethnic groups, um, <laughs> poverty levels, education levels. They could even go into Google itself and look at whether there's a correlation, say, between the number of burglaries and proximity to um, transport hubs or the density of the population and the incidence of crime there. So they did not actually report, but they, they needed to look at the map and see what kinds of stories they can get before they go out into the streets. So it's using it as a thinking and a reporting tool. So using this exercise, the, the students were then encouraged to use maps in their reporting projects. One of the projects that one of the students worked on was looking at prescription methadone. There's been a rise in the prescription of methadone throughout the country in the last few years. And methadone is now used as a painkiller and is prescribed by doctors. And there have been a number of deaths resulting from um, the misprescription because doctors didn't know that methadone can be lethal, for example, when taken in combination with Xanax or any other drugs. So what she did, can we, can we shift towards the left? was to get data, publicly available data, from the DEA and the CDC, which had a spreadsheet of data looking at three-digit zip codes and the number of methadone uh, prescriptions in those zip codes. So, and then, with Jeremiah's help, we mapped it in, um, you, you see the left map is prescription methadone, the prescribed methadone in 2001, and you see that in five years it had spread throughout the country and the number of deaths that you see from the other map has also, sp has also spread. So you wouldn't see this, this spread by just looking at a spreadsheet with three digits of codes and the number of uh, uh, methadone prescriptions there, but you could see it graphically in the map. And she e ended up doing this story for the New York Times. The story came out on the front page of the New York Times and the map came out also as a graphic for the New York Times. So inspired that by this, we thought that it might be a good idea to sort of mainstream the use of mapping as a reporting tool and as a visualization tool, um, especially now with the web when readers are much more, you know, much more likely to look at graphics rather than read massive amounts of text. So we, since this is an election year, we thought that it might be a good idea for all the students in the Graduate School of Journalism to use maps in the basic reporting writing course of the, of the school, which is RW1, where um, students report on New York neighborhoods. And we thought, with CCN MTL's help, that if we could put demographic data, census tract data, and election district data together in the map so people, when they cover elections, can see, for example, the election district they're covering, what is the percentage of Hispanics or whites or Asians there, what's the poverty level there, what's the density of it there. So this is the mapping that we I can't report any results yet because the elections haven't happened and the students are still using this for the first time. But again, we're using it both to generate story ideas, to see trends and patterns that students can write about, but also to use images that they can then put on their websites. Each reporting and writing class at the journalism school has a website that showcases the news reports, the stories that students write during the course. So I turn over to Maria who will explain how, how this is done. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is just show you what this mapping experience might be like from a student's perspective and how they would be using this software as they go about their reporting this semester. So we started uh, a wiki, and this wiki is open to anybody at Columbia University, although right now it's used primarily by the RW1 students in the journalism school. 
And we have a basic introduction here on the home page, uh, followed by a few uh, links here on the left. So I'll just take you through these briefly. I'll start with resources. We didn't want to just give students the maps that we were putting together. We wanted to show them that there was other stuff available, that they weren't limited by what we could provide to them, but rather there were lots of places that they could go for information that they could use to compare and contrast to the information we were giving them. So we have two sections of resources here. We have online resources, uh, and of particular note here is the American Community Survey. The data that we provided is from the 2000 census. So at this point, it, it's slightly dated. The American Community Survey, however, they do a uh, survey annually. They don't pull quite as large a sample, so it's not entirely reflective of the population, but it is more up to date. So students would be able to compare it to the 2000 census data that we provide. And then beyond the online resources, we also have links to every single New York City and state agency that students might find useful in their research for this election campaign. And then of course we had to provide instructions because what good is all of this technology without step-by-step -step how to page for how to actually use it. So you'll see that we start with using Google Earth and for those of you who aren't familiar with it, Google Earth is uh, an interactive globe, although that really simplifies it, and it's free software that you can download for Google, uh, from Google, available on both uh, Macs and Windows. So we provided instructions about how to download that, how to import the data files that we provide here in this data library, and then how to do things like add a pen to a map and save a particular map as an image for them to embed in the article that they write. And then the most important page here is the actual Google Earth data files. And you can see here that we have uh, quite a library of individual data sets that students can download and view in Google Earth. And essentially, a student only has to visit this page once, because if you download the file once, it automatically saves to Google Earth, and you can have the entire library on your computer. You don't have to come back to this page and re-download them. So I've gone ahead and downloaded a few files and already imported them into Google Earth because they're quite large, so I'll show you what that's like. All I did was download them to my desktop and double-click them, so it's really quite a simple download process. And you can see that they open up here uh, in the panel on the left. And one of the things we did was include election, election district borders. Since students are focusing on individual <coughs> districts, we wanted to be able to isolate the information for them. So the yellow lines that you see are the actual district borders, and these uh, black and white squares, when you zoom in, you see that they correspond to specific districts. And if I click on a square, I find out exactly what district I'm in. If I'm looking at this from uh, a bird's eye view, that gets a little bit cumbersome and annoying. So what I can do is I can come here, and I can just turn those points off so I can get just the borders. Now, as a student, the quickest way to find an election district is just to find an address within that district and just enter that. But if I wanted to look at different districts in the area and find out what number they were, I could do that as well. So uh, let's say I'm doing a report and I'm looking at a comparison of uh, election results in Woodside, Queens, and in Jackson Heights. So I would start by coming up here and typing in Woodside and Google Earth automatically takes me there. And I might conduct one or two interviews in Woodside, Queens, so I want to I wanna make sure that I save this point. So I'm going to come up here to this little push pin icon and click on that. And I'm just going to type here. We'll call this interview one. And I'll save that, and I now have my push pin there. Just come up here and turn off these borders. And then I'm going to come back up and I'm going to go to Jackson Heights so that I have a, a second point. And you can see that Google Earth automatically takes me there and I'm just going to add a second pin here and I'll call this interview two. And I'm just going to zoom out a little bit. So I have my wood side, which I don't know where that pin went, but I have Woodside there. Ah, here we go. Interview one. 
And now I can look at different data sets laid over these two locations. So I can start, if I wanted to look with a salt, I could look at a salt and see how that compares. If I scroll down, I can look at how many, the percentage rather of naturalized citizens in a given area, and they correspond to the percentages up at the top. I could also look at the percentage of the population living below the federal poverty line. I can look at the percentage of residents who are tenant residents and not owner residents. And if I had downloaded the entire library of data sets here, I could compare and contrast different data sets to see, you know, are there trends in this area that might influence the way I write this particular article. So if I find that this is something I want to use in my article, I'll come up here and I can do several things. I can just copy the image if I want and paste it. If I want to save it, I can come up and just click File, Save. And I can just save the image, you'll see right here. I can also email a copy of the image if I'm not working on my own computer and if I'm working on a computer either at the library or at the journalism school lab. So what does this look like in practice? Well, we, at, we have a sample article here that's from a former election, but that, that applied. And we'll be seeing more of this at the end of November. So this student wrote about uh, citizens in New York, in Woodside and Jackson Heights, who are voting for the fir first time. They voted for the first time in 2006. And you can see that the map we used here was the percentage of foreign-born naturalized citizens living in Woodside, Queens. And although this uh, library was built for this current election, given that there's a big mayoral race coming up as well, we'll be using this in the future. And we'll be using this data hopefully until the next census data comes out. And this is something that we can keep updating for the journalism school so that they have this tool at their disposal to inform uh, the way they write their articles. And then uh, in December, we'll take some of the um, best student examples of using mapping in this way. And we'll post them on this site as well so that future students have an example uh, to look at when they do their own reporting. And at this time, uh, we'd like to take questions. And John is going to come up to, to moderate that. But yeah, you're welcome to stop. Google? Is this the basic free Google or the commercial? Uh, no, no, this was all done using free software. And, and as there's going to be a microphone floating around. Uh, Catherine Hagen has it. The other questions. The, the first question was, was this free Google? Uh, yes, it was, that there are uh, deluxe versions one could purchase as well. But again, it's a great example of how these things can be customized and they're very developer friendly. So you saw the New York Neighborhoods Project, the map embedded into a wiki site. And those are things that uh, are, are quite interesting for us, taking these tools and, and integrating them into these classroom projects. Um, how complicated are the data files? And if you want to prepare your own data file, how difficult is it to do that? Uh, this is a great time for me to say that none of this could have been done without the help of Jeremiah Christensen, who's sitting right there in the middle, and he's actually much more able to answer that question than I am. So, Jeremiah, if you wouldn't mind. If, uh, if, if, you, if you've used the census data before um, and GIS before, it's actually not too difficult to do it, and this is something that we do help with, um, located in EDS, which is in Lehman, Lehman Library. So if you are looking to do this and would like, to, like help getting started with it, we're more than happy to help out with it. Uh, but it's essentially just downloading the data from the Census Department um, or Census Bureau and also grabbing census boundary files, joining those things together and then deciding on the classes that you want and displaying them. In ex well, you do that in the GISF software and then export it out into the KML or KMZ file. When I uh, brought this project to Jeremiah's attention, I had no experience uh, manipulating census data. I had never seen GIS software before. And in a few hours, he had me on my way to building this library. And he, he was always there, or somebody from his staff was there to answer questions. I think the big thing is just planning ahead, because it's, it's a little uh, time consuming. So the further in advance you can plan for a project like this, the better. What is he again? What is he based? Is he, oh, he's in Lehman Library. You need a map to get there, though. I mean, it's, it's, a, <laughs> Google map, right? it's way down there. Is it the first floor of the Lehman? At the basement? Yeah, the second floor. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. It sounded like a, a number of the projects that were um, 
uh, discussed by the panelists were uh, projects where the students had to work collaboratively. And I'm wondering how that uh, affected um, the pedagogy specifically from the assessment standpoint and determining uh, where uh, appropriate, uh, I guess, uh, value was put upon the work that they did based on their individual uh, performance. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, well, certainly the projects all had a standardized look to them, but um, we didn't really take that into account when we were grading the projects. Some of them were much more complete than others. Uh, so we still had to use some traditional uh, pedagogical methods, at least for anal analyzing uh, what they did. However, I think there was a level of pride in, in their projects. So in many ways, the students worked harder because they knew the, uh, the project would be more public to the rest of the class. I have a question about the uh, New York Neighborhoods Project. It's twofold. One, did I understand correctly that um, the students provided all the text and other content that we saw, and were they provided with a template that, that they could just then fill in? Or? Yeah, the students, it's a history course, so they did have to do the research to, uh, to get the information, but the template was provided by uh, CNMTL. Uh, here it is. They had to, it, it's, it has, it's a pretty rough outline of, of what they were to do, but in that way it kind of standardized the format for all the projects to have the same kind of appearance. Uh, the information, of course, varied from, from project to project depending on the teams that were working on, on it. Thank you. Perhaps while the microphone's moving around. Uh, Ken Jackson's course on average has about 300 students, so our decision to use the template was, uh, was also a logistical one uh, as far as managing it and, and thinking about ways that the TAs and the instructor could in indeed look at this material and evaluate it appropriately. Um, my question relates to the last one. Um, it's great because well, in the, uh, the History of New York City tour, um, it's great because you kept collecting a lot of student data. Um, can you see interesting ways of actually taking that information and using it as a learning tool and helping people to construct narratives from that content? Uh, you mean in, in, in a broader way so that it can benefit the yeah, public? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we're, we're actually working on. Uh, we're going to try to uh, develop it further and see uh, the see if we can't possibly, we would have to, before it would go public, we would have to vet it very closely and make sure it's all accurate and copacetic. Uh, but after that, we could make uh, real use of it and make it a public service, yes. Is that, is that what you meant? Yeah, that's, I guess, yeah, I just wanted to see what potentials you have. Yeah. With the uh, collusion of the course, was it possible for did some students to carry forward on that research, or was that pretty much, it just ended at that point? It would be really nice if they did, but no, when the course is over, they, they just, they don't bother to go back to and, it. And I guess the other question with that is, you know, could, would that be something, if they did something with, you know, if they developed a project, could they include that into an e-portfolio? I would think so, yes, you know, absolutely. Maybe they did some really good research, you know, maybe that would be something they could build upon. Right, no, definitely. Actually, it was a, in the same vein, uh, whether the students' work in, in one semester is, is, is kept as an archive for the next year students to build upon if they want. Yes, it's an interesting point. Actually, we're talking about what would happen uh, when all of the neighborhoods are, are have uh, projects that are when all the neighborhoods are done, so to speak, we could build on what was already done and have students revisit other students' work and, and make it better uh, or improve on it or uh, update it. Uh, so yes, it's, it's a work in progress, uh, uh, but at this point, there's still many, many more uh, neighborhoods we haven't, we haven't covered. So. Um, the data files that you've already prepared, are they restricted to Columbia or are they uh, available outside? 
and then more generally, is there a library of data files that Google has or someone else has that's public? Uh, right now these files are password protected. You need a, a uni in order to get in, but anybody with the uni can see them. And there are uh, KML files out there. Many people make them and post them publicly. Uh, Jeremiah, you might know where to find those. I just do random searches if I'm looking for something specific. Google does have a community um, website where you can go, go and view and download files uh, depending on what the topic is that you're looking for. There's, there's also um, free data visualization tools on a site called Many Eyes that's run by IBM. They have a very simple mapping tool there that you can put data in a spreadsheet, you know, two rows of data, for example, and then they'll map it for you without going through the complex things that you need to go through when you do Google Earth. You can look, at it, look it up on Many Eyes and it's run by IBM. It's a free site. The only thing there is you have to make the data public for everybody. Uh, Professor Coronel, I wanted to ask you, um, hi, I wanted to ask, I know the session that's taking place in the rotunda there, one of the topics will be the changing nature of the profession, and I'd be just interested in hearing your comments about how you see digital tools and, and uh, the things that you're beginning to experiment with uh, and their capacity to change the nature of what it means to be an investigative journalist. Um, journalism is changing very fast, I think faster than we at the journalism school can adjust to the changes. And a lot of the journalism is moving online towards greater interactivity. And there's, there's many trends. One, well, especially in investigative journalism, is the increasing use of graphics and, uh, and databases, using, giving um, the audience not just sifted through information, but all the information that journalists get that is searchable. So, for example, campaign data that you can search for on the web. Um, financial disclosure data, so it's, it, it requires a lot more of, of journalists working with people who can do data management software, that, that's one trend. The other trend is in the narrative structures, the way we tell stories is different because it's not just textual anymore, we have to use a lot of multimedia elements. And the third way is the interaction with the audience. We need to make the audience part of, uh, it's no longer, I, this is it, and take it or leave it. We have to, the audience is now increasingly part of even the conceptualizing <coughs> and the reporting of the story and in the commenting on the story. So it's, it's really changing all the parameters and our notions of traditional journalism. And it really requires much more savvy use of digital technology. And fortunately, our students are much more adept at it actually than, than we are or than we will ever be. And I think part of this is we just have to let go and let them you know, it, it's even, even the paradigm of teaching becomes different because it becomes also more collaborative with, with students increasingly taking on the role and the instructor no longer being the part of eternal wisdom. But, you know, someone who's just older there in the classroom and more experienced. <laughs> I think on that note, I would like to, again, thank our presenters for uh, joining us. they're going to uh, stick around for the conference and if there are other questions people had uh, you can uh, cast them as you're wandering about. There'll be another session here in 10 minutes and another one uh, outside and your schedule has all the details. Thank you again. We'll be taking your evaluation forms on your way out.